All right, guys, welcome back to more 428, the Shibuya Scramble. My name is Raven from the Sky, and let's continue. Mr. Osawa? It's Kajiwara. Ah, perfect timing. Osawa hurried to let the detective into the study. The boat track is picking up signals. Oh, that's from all over the room. What should I do? Mr. Osawa, please calm down. As if that were even possible right now. It feels like there must be 10, no, maybe 100 listening devices in here. Gajarara didn't miss a beat. Let me be honest with you. That bug tracker is... All of a sudden, a, a different noise cut in over the bug tracker. Gajarara here, hmm, Kano. Gajarara's customary nonchalant expression vanished into a sudden seriousness. Sorry, hold on, he continued. I can't really hear you. He headed out of the room, the phone clutched to his ear. Osawa was left to wonder what the detective had been about to tell him. The bug tracker was, was what? What the heck was going on? The sound wasn't stopping. Deciding that it'd be better, he'd better do something. Osawa took the bug tracker and checked behind his bookcase. It didn't seem like the signal was coming from back there. He proceeded to pull each and every one of the books off the shelf. Nothing. He checked the area around his computer, scanned the monitor, the case, the power outlet. But nothing. But this device was to be anywhere. Found a small screwdriver and dismantled the mouse. The brown circuit board was lined with chips, but nothing appeared out of the ordinary. Just try to find it. Go ahead, look everywhere. He was being ridiculed. The sound just wouldn't stop. Still, the time ticked past. Had it been five minutes, ten, maybe more? He began to lose hope that he could find the listening devices and even to stop caring. Instead, he was overcome with the feeling that this room, which for years had been a sanctuary, had ceased to be his own. It was as if something other had intruded and laid claim to his personal space. In his fevered mind, he began to hear the tracker sound as a high-pitched laugh and the curse relentless nor is cruel and taunting the mockery of the devil himself Bug tracker against the god darn it I don't care I know the battery get out of the way against the wall then he picked it up only to smash it back to the floor and he stomped it on it ferociously it was a satisfying snap accompanied by the sensation of the thing being crushed underfoot The noise stopped. Or oh, well, it ought to have. And yet, for some reason, the horrid noise kept sounding in, Ors in Osawa's ears. It was coming from the bug tracker after all. It was inside his own head. <laughs> Somewhere in his safe, echoing within his skull. No, the noise didn't stop, it only grew louder. Why? 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 Why was he being tormented like this? He couldn't take it anymore. He couldn't even think straight anymore. He felt his mind begin to dissolve. Bad ending. Brain freeze. The inconsistent beeping from the bug tracker wound up driving Asawa out of his mind. What Kajira was about to say just before he got in a phone call was pretty crucial for Asawa to hear. Unfortunately, the call distracted him and left him before, and he left before he could finish his thought. Things would have gone differently only if someone hadn't called Detective Kajira right then. Okay.
Carl moved at a glacial pace towards the crime syndicate's hangout. Stanley pounded his fist on the steering wheel in frustration. They had no sooner set out than the traffic slowed to a near standstill. Despite the occasional lurch, never crept above a crawl. Traffic jam! Kano stewed in the passenger seat. The case was rapidly getting out of his hand, out of hand. Now he had to worry about the safety of both Maria and her sister Hitomi, never mind the fact that Detective Tatino had also gone missing. There were too many unknowns, too many uncertainties. His unease was growing unbearable. Also, uh, Tatino hadn't radioed in, and like, we can't reach him from our end either? Kuze's words kept echoing inside Kano's head. What could have caused Tatino to drop out of contact? Someone had gone after him while Kano and the others were busy trailing the Attache case. Could Tatino have been... No, it couldn't be. Kano was sure Tatino would have done whatever was necessary to keep Itomi safe. Stanley broke the long silence. What's on your mind? Still thinking about that call from Kuze? Kano didn't answer. Look, if you were worrying about that other detective, the guy couldn't even protect one girl, Stanley continued. Not exactly a ringing endorsement. Don't you talk about Detective Tatino that way. I'm concerned about Hitomi Osawa, but the missing Itachi case needs to come first. Stanley's expression remained stone cold. Kano flashed him a sidelong glare, then went back to staring out the window. A moment later, a flurry of motion in a nearby alley caught his eye. With a start, he recognized Sasayama. His fellow detective was caught up in an altercation with the man in dark clothes. Kano sprang into action, his body moving almost before his mind registered the situation. Sasayama! Swing the door open, he laughed out of the car. Hey, wait! Stanley called after him. But Kano was already sprinting toward the fight. Oof! The other man knocked Sasayama into, onto a pile of garbage. As Sasayama struggled to get back to his feet, his opponent looked down at him with a triumphant sneer. Kano finally got a good look at the man, and his eyes flashed down with recognition. It was the perp who first taken the Attache case back at the scramble. Tariq al Karaman. You! He sped like a bullet to tackle al Karaman around the legs. But al Karaman nimbly stepped aside. Kano's arms closed on nothing but air. At the same moment, al Karaman deftly wrapped an arm around Kano's neck. Kano felt the vice-like pressure on his cardioid artery. A move known as the front choke sleeper hold. Constricting the cardioid artery stops blood flow to the brain, causing the opponent to lose consciousness, also known as a guillotine choke. His consciousness quickly began to slip away. Oh no you don't, you bastard. Lowering his center of gravity, he got hold of the shoulder as a fold from against him. Yeah. Despite the arm still crushing his neck, Kano managed to lift his opponent high into the air. As he managed to lift his opponent high into the air, he continued the movement to heave his arm up and over himself, slamming him upside down to the heap of trash. Stanley strode up to the aftermath of the struggle. Well, you've got the brawn part down, he said. Need some work on the brains. al Karan was sprawled out atop the mound of refuse. He'd been knocked out cold. Sasayama coughed and sputtered. Kano went to help him to his feet, but Stanley stepped in between them. What are you doing? Helping Sasayama? What does it look like? We need to apprehend al Karoran first. He's not even conscious. Sasayama can come first. He pushed Stanley aside and crouched down alongside his partner. Are you alright, he asked? Yeah. You're bailing me out, though. You can't let the missus know about that. Mum's the word, Kano said. He slipped an arm underneath Sasayama and helped him to his feet. I managed to find the guy who had the Tache case. But when I tried to arrest him, 
This fella came out of nowhere and attacked me. So here we go again. This will ban direct orders, Stanley Muffle. What's the deal with Japanese police anyway? He shook his head in ex <laughs> exasperation. Sasayama gave Kano a puzzled look, jerking his thumb at the American. Who's this guy? It's a long story. He filled Sasayama in on the situation. Enough chit chat. Hurry up and cuff this guy, Stanley said. Kano knelt down by Al Karama's unconscious body, flipped him over, and proceeded to cuff his hands behind his back. Hmm, Kano paused. Al Karama's sleeve had slid back from his wrist. What's this? An unconscious man had a tattoo of a two headed scorpion on his left forearm. Find something? Yes, I think this guy might be the ringleader. Seeing the image had reminded Kano of something he'd heard back at the headquarters that the head of the foreign syndicate had a scorpion tattoo. He relayed this information to Stanley. I see. Stanley called up Kuze on the cell. Then we have to know that the guy with the attacher case is still at large, he said. Apprehending the ringleader at this point shouldn't be an issue. One of your so very capable subordinates gave us a big step forward in the case here. Wait a second, Sasayama murmured. Was, sarca was sarcasm, wasn't it? I mean, that was sarcasm, wasn't it? Stanley hung up and called over to him. Think you can escort this guy back to the precinct? Yeah, sure. Seeing how very capable I am. Kano felt his phone vibrate. The display showed an oncoming call from Rumi. Hello, he answered warily, keeping his voice down. Stanley had him a, a little on edge. It's me. It was Shuz Shizu. Hammond. Kano thought, did not have the time for this right now. But if he just hung up, he might even be, be he might be in even deeper hot water. Kano decided to have t had to take that risk. He hung up the phone. Decided he better listen to what the old man had to say. Kano decided he better listen to what the old man had to say. Hello, sir. I'm afraid I'm not really at liberty to take a personal car right now, even if it is from my father-in-law. It is best to sound apologetic. I'm not your father-in-law. Ah, uh, yes, of course. Sorry, sir. Bowed his head reflectively, feeling like an idiot. You really don't give a darn about keeping me waiting like this, do you? Sir, I swear to you, I feel terrible. Please, I just... Flustered, he took a deep breath and recomposed himself. I promise you, sir. I promise I'll be there. If you can just wait a little while. Don't make promises you can't keep. Shizu's barking reboot made Kam Kano break out into a sweat. You think I'm going to let you off the hook just because you're working a case? This is exactly why I don't want my daughter with some detective. Great. Another angry tirade. But didn't you used to be a detective, sir? Kano muttered. You watch yourself, you little brat. It's not enough that you keep calling me your father-in-law. Now you have to bring that up? Evidently, Kano had touched a raw nerve. Ever have a dentist hit a nerve while drilling a tooth? That's where this expression comes from. It seemed like anything he said only made matters worse. Well, you're not off the hook, she said. I'm never letting my daughter marry the likes of you. His fury hitting its crescendo, Shizu promptly hung up. How on earth does Shizu hold such an intense malice toward police detectives when he'd been one himself? Kano had become a detective for Rumi's, sec Rumi's sake in the first place, and now it was the biggest thing holding him back. Hey, come on. Stanley's voice snapped Kano out of his daze. Grimly, he followed the American back to the car. Yet again, Stanley was thumping the steering wheel in frustration. Traffic hadn't let up one bit. 
It's starting to look like they might never make it to the foreign syndicate's hangout. Kano caught sight of a girl in a hoodie, weaving her way between stopped cars on foot. Miku Morita was a fighter at the cosplay fighting club, fighting club Bride, but just decided to retire after losing to Tama, the cat, in a street fight. She's thinking about what to do with herself now. He rolled down the window and called it to her. Excuse me, miss. Did something happen? Huh? What do you mean? With the road, I mean. What's with all the traffic? Oh, right. Apparently, there was some big accident over by the train station. That's probably what's causing it. Really? Yeah. I don't think you guys are going to be going anywhere for quite a while. She smiled and went on her way. Stanley gave the steering wheel another punch. <laughs> well, I guess they did say this wasn't just some typical ransom case, he muttered. Kano saw an opportunity. They're not after the money, but what are they after? Stanley kept his eyes forward, acting as if he hadn't heard. Look, Kano said, I can't help you if you keep me out of the loop. After a few moments of thought, Stanley replied with a single monosyllable. Drugs. What? Maria's father, Kenji Osawa, I assume you're aware he works for Okoshi's Pharmaceutical. I am. Nothing's been made public yet, but Osawa has recently oversaw the development of a new drug. A new drug to be in development for 15 years or more with expenses totaling 20 to 30 billion yen, roughly 200 to 300 million US dollars. Before it is approved, worldwide demand and sensational profits can be expected if a groundbreaking medicine is developed. Nonetheless, pharmaceutical companies are often under major pressure due to the tremendous cost of labor and equipment. And someone is trying to get their hands on it. Kano's mind latched onto his new information, trying to assemble pieces of an involving puzzle. Someone who? An international criminal mastermind. This foreign syndicate is merely a tool in someone else's game. Kano regarded Stanley's face carefully. He looked more cold and serious than ever. So wait, does that mean that the reason we're letting this syndicate walk around unfettered? So on my orders, yes. I see. So the only one thing you're really concerned with is catching this international mastermind. Precisely. Kano felt like he was starting to get the picture of what sort of person Stanley was. So you don't really care what happens to the girl who's been abducted, do you? Not particularly, no. Why do you have a problem with that? Kano clenched his fist. Hand was shaking with anger. Dick dictum number eight. When you really want to punch something, you really probably shouldn't. Kano re re recited the words inwardly like some sort of desperate mantra. If he didn't manage to calm himself down, he was liable to slam his fist right into Stanley's face. Outside the car, the traffic remained at a standstill. Kano chaffed it against a feeling of utter futility. One after another, his uncertainties came to nag at him. Was Maria still safe? What had happened to Hitomi and, Tatino, and Tatino, her bodyguard? And now, on top of all of this, it struck Kano as rather careless to send Sasayama away with Al Karan without any backup. Now that Jack, now that Jack had alerted him to the presence of a dangerous international mastermind still on the loose, fighting back his fit of Pequay to do something impulsively out of irritation, resentment, or the like, similar to doing something in a huff. Kano got out. Dialed up Tatsuyama, he wanted to make sure his partner had gotten the Alcorn back to the precinct safely. Dialed up Detective Kajiwara, who was stationed at the Osara residence. He hoped it would. Oh, nah. See, it's a good thing we figured out that bad ending. So, uh, you could uh, These both seem liable. Probably would have picked this. So, we're going to go with A. Dialed up his partner. He wanted to make sure his partner had gotten Alcorn. Carwan back to the precinct safely.
Sasayama picked up almost right away. Kind of what Kano, what's up? How are things on your end? Any problems getting Akaron back? Nah, I've got attention on taking care of him. Wait, what? Kano could hardly believe his ears. You were in touch with Tatino, he asked. He could hear the shock in his own voice. Yeah, just bumped into him over by the precinct a little while ago. Then he is safe. Kano felt a surge of relief. What about Hitomi then? Stanley glanced over at him, curious. Tatino says he lost track of her somehow. And then he got called back to the precinct, apparently. Tatino had lost track of her? That's not like him, Kano thought. Since he was heading back there anyway, I handed our guy over to him, Sasayama said. I see. Kano was glad to hear that Tatino was all right, but his relief was tempered by a surge of anger at the thought of what had happened to Hitomi. Now I'm back to telling the Attache case, Sasayama continued. Today's my wife's birthday, you know. My plan is to wrap this thing up ASAP so we can celebrate tonight. I've already got a present and everything. I envy you, man. Closing his eyes, Kano took a moment to picture Rumi, but Shizu's face popped up in his mind's eye right alongside her. Well, just hang in there, buddy. Even if your girlfriend is just a picture of Masami Nakahama. Ha <laughs> ha! Still snickering, Sasayama hung up. Kano bit his lip and slipped his phone back into his pocket. Long last, traffic began to move again. Almost as soon as it did, however, Stanley had to slam on the brakes. The abrupt stop made Kano smack his head against the windshield. Hey, what gives? Look, Stanley said. He gestured with his chin. Kano couldn't believe his eyes. We were walking along the sidewalk. Ahead was Al Karan, very much not in custody. What the heck? Kano shouted, already hopping out of the car. Stanley was right behind him. He crept upon the target as silently as possible, then rushed him once they got close. In a moment, they had subdued him. Kano used his own body weight to hold Al Karan down. What are you doing out here? He demanded. Whoa, hey. Guess you didn't get the memo, huh? Our car on one flashed a coy grin. They let me go. Let you go. I think your buddy here might have hearing problems, Al Quan said to Stanley. Free man. Kano turned and glared at Stanley. What what is he talking about? No idea. First things first, get this guy back to the precinct. I'll head to the syndicate and hang out by myself. You don't think this is weird, Kano asked? I mean, what the heck is this guy doing so on the loose then again what matters is that he is free maybe he's telling the truth about being let go but that's ridiculous then I guess he must have escaped on his own Stanley replied in either case your buddy screwed up royally now it's on you to unscrew things what none of this sat right with Kano it's not sitting right with me but the fact remained that he couldn't just let Al Karawan grow he gave Stanley detailed directions to the hangout and the car sped away towards Yoogi. Then Kano headed back to the precinct with his captive, trying to reassure himself that he might learn something from questioning Al Karawin that would help resolve the case. Kano sat opposite Al Karawin in the interrogation room. He'd been attempting to interview the suspect for about a quarter of an hour. Al Karawin sat ramrod stiff, not responding to any prompts or questions. What time is it right now? They've taken away his watch, his wallet, a small knife, and his keychain. This was the third time he'd asked to know the time. Why are you so concerned with what time it is? Al Carwin gave no reply. Are you waiting on something? Again, the suspect was staunchly silent. Kano was sure what to make of this, but he took a look at his watch. It's around two o'clock. What's the time exactly? It's 2.18. 2.18 in how many seconds? Look, just cut the crap. Kano grabbed the prisoner by the collar. What the heck are, are you people laughing? Al Karwin merely repeated his question. What time is it right now? With a growl of accusation, <laughs> Kano shoved his wristwatch in Al Karwin's face. 2.20, Al Karwin said. Okay then, that should do it. What? What does that mean? 
The interrogation went on for several more hours. Despite Kano's best efforts, however, Al Carlwin said nothing more. During all that time, the case continued to develop in unexpected ways. The Kano stuck in and the interrogation room knew nothing about it until everything was already over and done. Bad ending. Lord have mercy. Come on, man. Give me a break. Questioning Al Carwin. Carwin. While Kano performed admiring and recapturing Terry Al Carwin, ironically, his action actually disrupted the investigation. Maybe letting the syndicate run free for the time being really was the right call. Someone can do something at 1340 that throws a wrench to Kano's activities. Thanks to the involvement of unrelated parties, and Kano's reaction will make the investigation play out differently. Okay. And on that note, guys, thanks for watching. My name is Raven from the Sky. If you enjoyed the episode, drop a like and subscribe to the channel and the series grow. Take care, and I'll catch you guys in the next episode. Peace out.